evam pravartitam chakram anu vartayatyaha aghayur indriya ramo mogham parta chajivati translation my dear arjuna one who does not follow in human life the cycle of sacrifice thus established by the vedas certainly leads a life full of sin living only for the satisfaction of the senses such a person lives in vain purport the Mammon the mammonist philosophy of work very hard and enjoy sense gratification is condemned he reign by the lord therefore for those who want to enjoy this material world the above mentioned cycle of performing yagyas is absolutely necessary one who does not follow such regulations is living a very risky life being condemned more and more by nature's law this human form of life is specially meant for self realization in either of three of the three ways namely karma yoga yagya yoga or bhakti yoga there is no necessity of rigidly following the performances of the prescribed yagyas for the transcendentalists who are above vice and virtue but those who are engaged in sense gratification require purification by the above mentioned cycle of yagya performances there are different kinds of activities those who are not krishna conscious are certainly engaged in sensory con consciousness therefore they need to execute pious work the yagya system is planned in such a way that sensory conscious persons may satisfy their desires without becoming entangled in the reaction of sense gratificatory work the prosperity of the world depends not on our own efforts but on the background arrangement of the supreme lord directly carried out by the demigods therefore the yagyas are directly aimed at the particular demigods mentioned in the vedas and directly is the practice of krishna consciousness because when one master the perform one masters the performance of yagyas one is sure to become krishna conscious but if by performing yagyas one does not become krishna conscious such principles are counted as only moral codes one should not therefore limit his progress only to the point of moral codes but should transcend them to attain krishna consciousness so <clears throat> prabhupada mentions here at the end one should not be satisfied just simply with practicing moral codes you know people have that impression they think i'm a good person i'm very moral you know i don't tell any lies i don't steal i don't break the laws i'm i'm very moral and they think that's enough but probably says that here is not enough he said they have to become krishna conscious we have to recognize you see we have to recognize there's a a, a proprietor personalities behind this world and there's one supreme personality over all the personalities there's one supreme being controlling everything and we have to recognize his position and work for his pleasure that that is the purpose of yagya or sacrifice yagya we have to do sacrifice so Prabhupada mentions the different processes which we can uh, practice some self-realization. Self-realization, of course, is not a yagya, but it's it's a pure. That's that's for the ultimate goal of life. 
But even those who are not interested in self-realization, they still have to do yagya. The, the importance of yagya, performing sacrifice for the pleasure of the Supreme. Just like you work, you, you live in a country, you have to pay taxes. Why do you have to pay taxes? Because the country takes care of you. They provide schools for education. They have a hospital if you get sick. They have police forces to protect you. In different ways, we're getting service from the government and we have to pay tax to them. So in the same way, we're all obliged to the supreme force behind the world. And we have to pay tax. We have, the tax comes in the form of yagya, in the form of sacrifice, performing sacrifice for the pleasure of Vishnu or Krishna. So Kali Yuga sacrifice, the yagya is the chanting of the holy name. That is the actual yagya, the real sacrifice through the chanting of the holy names. And when we perform the yagya properly, then you'll see how life becomes peaceful and satisfying. Just like if you're a criminal and you're not following the laws, you're always worried, when are the police going to come and arrest you? And so in the same way, you know, just like in Switzerland, if, if you go on the bus and you don't have the proper ticket, the policeman may come and they get you and they fine you. So these things happen. So the same way, if we don't do yagya, then we're in the same position. Our life is very, very precarious, very uh, dangerous. We're in a very uh, troublesome situation. So very important, people have to learn to do proper yagya. And in this way, everyone becomes satisfied. We perform sacrifice for the pleasure of Krishna. And by satisfying Krishna, then all the other demigods are all satisfied. Right? Any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, when... Um... Uh, uh, in the incarnation uh, of um, Krishna, uh, example like um, Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, uh, all these considered uh, demigods, Maharaj? No, no, not at all. They're not considered demigods. They're considered avatars. Avatar means one who descends. They come from the spiritual world. So Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Nashri, they're all avatars, they're all forms of the Lord, the Supreme Lord himself, coming in different forms. They're not considered demigods. Demigods are on a different platform. Demigods are jivas, but when these different avatars, they're all Vishnu himself. They're the Supreme Lord who takes different forms. But the demigods are jivas, they're living entities. They take birth and they die. But the avatars, they don't die. They have eternal forms. So there's a gulf of difference between the demigods and the Supreme Lord. This is something, this is something you have to understand carefully. Now people worship, pe people worship demigods like Ganesh and Durga and Lord, Bra Lord Brahma, sometimes even Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is a very special demigod, but still he's also, con he's also considered the demigod. He's not exactly the Supreme Lord. 
but he, at the same time, he's more than just the ordinary demigod because he's almost God. And he has a special relationship with the Supreme Lord. But he's not the Supreme Lord. But there are 33 crore demigods and they're in charge of the different functions of the material world. Just like Indra is the god of rain, Vayu is the god of wind, Hagni is the god of fire. Like there's so many different demigods for everything. There's some demigod in charge, there's a demigod to help us digest our food. There's a demigod controlling our movements of our eyes. Everything, many 33, 330 million demigods. And they're jivas, they're living entities. All right, they've taken that position on account of their piety. But Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, they are Lord Vishnu. Now, Lord Vishnu has his different forms, different incarnations. And we know they have particular purpose in appearing. Just like Lord Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita, why he appears and his purpose in coming in this world. He comes to, one purpose is to give pleasure to his devotees and to annihilate the demons. And he also comes to reestablish principles of religion. And sometimes he comes to adjust some anomaly, some problem within the universe. Just like his Lord Varaha, he picks up the earth from the bottom of the universe. And his Lord Matsya, he saved the Vedas when there was an inundation and flood. Do you understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Any other question? Guru Maharaj, I didn't understand this line. The Agnya system is planned in such a way that uh, sensory conscious persons may satisfy their desires without being entangled in the reaction of sense gratificatory work. Yes. So, yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So, if we offer it to the demigods uh, or supreme god, then we don't have any reactions for uh, like. Well, if somebody wants something material, they have some material desire, right? Maybe they want to get wealth. So, they perform a yagya and they may satisfy the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. And Lakshmi may bestow her blessings on them and they get the money they wanted. So that's uh, a yagya planned so that the sense, the person who wants sense gratification can satisfy his desires and without being entangled in the reactions of sense gratificatory work. He didn't have to do any kind of material uh, sense gratification to get the money. He did it by a Vedic system, by performing a yagya, pleasing Lakshmi. And she was pleased to bestow the Lakshmi, the money the person wanted. The same way, you know, different desires are there. Somebody want, has a health problem, they may worship the sun god and they do a yagya to satisfy the sun god. And somebody has an exam, they may worship the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of learning, to do well in their exam. And in this way, so they, they're not getting any reactions for that because they're following a Vedic system. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Reactions of sense gratificatory work. Sense gratificatory work 
you, you know, we're working to get something from somebody else. So, you know, this is the law of karma. You're under the law of karma. Sense gratificatory work means the law of karma. You're working to get something. You, you, you have to do something. Maybe, and you will do something which is maybe not good karma. You will act, act against the laws of the Vedas. You do some vikarmic activity. You take part in some sinful activities or something to get the money. Somebody may gamble. And somebody may cheat to get the money. And this way you get, you get karma. But if you do the yagya, you don't get karma. But if you try to satisfy our material desires by just doing some material activities, there will be karma. And that karma will keep you entangled in the material world. Of course, the yagya is also material, but it's according to the Vedas. So in some ways, there's some benefit there. You're not going to get the reactions from it. You'll get what you can get the results you want from it without being punished, without having any uh, unpleasant reactions. That's the point. I have a question, Guru Maharaj. Mm -hmm. So, if I am used to, if somebody is uh, used to with the Vedic tradition and used to um, offering sacrifice or obeisances to the demigods, and later on, if um, we are doing the same sacrifices but with the intention for Krishna consciousness, is it okay? Yes. Well, no. Generally, we don't. You know. You can't, you can't worship demigods, really, in Krishna consciousness. It's, uh, well, it's, it, that's not really the process, although, well, you know, to worship the demigods, you see, you have to understand that the, the worship that, which you offer to the demigods is actually meant to be offered to the Supreme Lord. So if you give it to the demigods without giving it to Krishna, there's a problem there. You've not recognized who is actually the proprietor. We are meant to offer to Krishna. Now there are some rare cases of people who would worship demigods understanding the demigods to be a part of the body of the Supreme Lord. Just like the sun god is the eye of the Supreme Lord. And uh, the, well, 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 the, the different demigods, they all represent some organ, some part of the body of the Supreme Lord. So if you worship a demigod in the mood that they are a part of the Supreme Lord, then you, you can do that. But it's not encouraged. It's not the usual way. Rather, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that whatever a man may offer to other gods is actually meant for me alone, but it is offered without proper understanding. So this is the problem. If you offer to the demigods, um, how are you going to do it in Krishna consciousness? You have to understand that demigod's relationship with Krishna. You have to understand how they represent one particular organ or one particular function of the body of the Supreme Lord. Then you could do it. But it's not the usual procedure. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Very clear.
Now we do have the example of the gopis. They worship Katyayani to get Krishna as a husband. <laughs> this is an, an example which is often given of people, devotees who worship demigods. And so the gopis, they worship the goddess Katyayani. It's a custom in bridge, among Brijbasi people that the young girls before marriage, they will do this Katyayani Vrat, which involves taking a bath early in the morning in the Yamuna and worshipping the goddess Katyayani. And the purpose of them doing this is they want to get a good husband. So the gopis all did this and they, they all wanted Krishna for a husband. So, so the gopis were allowed to worship Katyayani to get Krishna as a husband. That was allowed. Prabhu, how is uh, Mata Katyani, um, why is she worshipped to get Krishna as a husband? She's Durga. No, it's a, it's a ritualistic custom. Okay. Among the village, in the village people, among the Brishbasi people, for the young girls, but before marriage, they should do this puja, you see, and the, there is, then they'll get a good husband. So the gopis all wanted to, to get Krishna for a husband. Okay. And the gopis are all great devotees. And so they, they were performing this vrat to get Krishna for a husband. And Krishna satisfied their desire. He accepted all of them as his wife. Because what happened was, well, it's, <laughs> it's a bit involved, but we can tell you briefly that Lord Brahma had stolen away the cowherd boys. So at that time, Lord Krishna expanded himself to take, a, to take the place of all the cowherd boys. And that was the time that the, Lord Brahma had stolen the cowherd boys away. It was a moment of Brahma's time it was one year on this planet. And during that one year, all the cowherd boys were married. And so at that time, all the cowherd boys were Krishna, but nobody knew. Krishna was playing the part of all the cowherd boys. And each and every cowherd boy was married to a gopi. <laughs> so all the gopis got Krishna for a husband. And this way, Krishna satisfied their desires. Yeah, you worship different, uh, just like you want to get a nice wife, you should worship Uma, the wife of Lord Shiva. And Uma, she's a very good wife, very beautiful, very chaste wife. And you worship Uma and you get a good wife. And the woman wants a good husband, she should worship Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is considered a very good husband. He's very faithful, very nice husband, very caring, loving for his wife. A woman wants a good husband, she worships Lord Shiva. And so it's also said the girl wants to get a good husband, she should worship Goddess Katyayani. Because Goddess Katyayani is controlling the material nature. She's Durga, right? So she can certainly arrange like this. <laughs> each, each of the demigods, they have some responsibility. So Katyayani has this function, her responsibility. She arranges the husbands and the wives or the marriages. So you please her, you get a good partner. Right? Yes, Guru Maharaj. So, sorry. Guru Maharaj, uh, sorry, Guru Maharaj. Go ahead. Yeah, question. Yeah, so sometimes uh, uh, when I see the sun, I just pray that, uh, like, uh, I, yeah, I, I understand that sun is the part of uh, Krishna, and I pray sometimes, like, uh, to give good health. To do more Krishna conscious activities, is it correct way or it's not needed, Guru Maharaj? 
Well, it's very nice to pray to the Sun God to do more Krishna conscious activities. Yes, very nice. You can pray like that. The Sun God is the most powerful planet in the universe. It's the eye of the Lord. So we we can pray to the the, the demigods also that to bless us with Krishna consciousness. Yes, Guru Maharaj. That we can consider that the demigods like the sun, they're good devotees. They're not pure devotees. We don't think of the demigods as being pure devotees, but they have some material desires. But they, they're taking a very big position in the universe. They must have performed many pious activities and they've been given a big responsibility in the universe on behalf of Lord Krishna. So we have to pray to the demigods that we can also serve Lord Krishna, just as they are doing service for Lord Krishna. We pray that we can also do some service on behalf of Lord Krishna. So like that. People like to worship demigods because generally it's easier to please them. The demigods are easily pleased, but they can also be easily angered. And they often give benedictions which may not be good for us. So you have to be careful in approaching the demigods. But Lord Krishna is very cautious that we may ask him for something and Lord Krishna may think, well, this is not very good. Why are, they, why are they asking me like this? And so Krishna will be very cautious about fulfilling our material desires. Because Krishna knows what's good for us. People are often impatient. They want results quickly. So they worship demigods but then they get trouble, they get problems. So it's much safer to worship Lord Krishna. All right? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Three point seventeen, Piranglo Prabhu. Do you want to read this? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Tvatmara Tirevasyad Atmatriptas Chamanava Atmani Evasa Cha Santushtas Tasyakaryam Navidyate. Translation. But for one who, who, uh, who takes pleasure in the self, whose human life is one of self-realization, and who is satisfied in the self only, fully satiated, for him there is no duty. Pure part. A person who is fully Krishna conscious and is fully satisfied by his acts in Krishna consciousness, no longer has any duty to perform. Due to his being Krishna conscious, all in, in piety within is instantly cleansed, an effect of many, many thousands of yagya performances. By such cleaning of consciousness, one becomes fully confident of his eternal position in relationship with the Supreme. His duty thus becomes self-illuminated by the grace of the Lord. And therefore, he no longer has any obligations in the Vedic injunctions. Such a Krishna conscious person is no longer interested in material activities 
and no longer takes pleasure in material arrangements like wine, women, and similar infatuations. So in contrast to the, the previous verse, Krishna is describing that if you're, if you're self-realized, you don't have to perform yagya <laughs> because you're, you're, you're so transcendentally situated. You've understood your spiritual nature. You're fully satisfied. You have, so there's no duty. There's, there's nothing to be done. You don't need to do any yagya. <laughs> this is, this is a, Prabhupada said, this is a person who is fully Krishna conscious. Of course, we're not. We're trying to become Krishna conscious. But if you are in that position, very fortunate position, then you don't need to do any of these yagyas. You don't have to perform any sacrifice. You don't have to do Vedic injunctions, follow the Vedic injunctions and things. Because you're in Krishna, because you're so situated in, in transcendence, you've understood yourself as a spiritual being, part and parcel of Krishna. So there's, there's nothing to do. Of course, this is, a, this is an elevated position. You have to be very advanced. Hmm. So we want we can become we can become like that. We just have but we have to go on, we have to follow the process. We have to purify the consciousness by purify the heart through the chanting of the holy name and by doing all the different things which are mentioned here. Follow, but when we follow the Vedic injunctions, then we purify ourselves, we make advancement. We go on following that, we'll become, we'll become self-realized, we'll actually come to understand our spiritual nature. Prabhupada said, Krishna conscious persons no longer interested in material, uh, material activities. He's not attracted to wine and women <laughs> and other infatuations, the pleasures of the material world. This is the so-called pleasure of the material world. This is the illusion of the material life. People are thinking wine, the opposite sex, enjoying, it's all temporary sense gratification, which ultimately leads to misery, leads to suffering. But if we become Krishna conscious, then we can overcome all of these things. So in the beginning, we have to, we have to endeavor to control, but naturally a taste awakens for chanting Hare Krishna. When you chant more, you will get more attraction, we, we develop more interest, more taste for the chanting of the holy name. And we have no interest, you know, wine, and just some, some alcoholic substance, you know, a horrible thing, makes you ill, doesn't do anything for you. And the attraction for the opposite sex also will give you so many troubles and problems. We have to learn to be peaceful and just to control the mind. So understanding our spiritual nature is very important. This is the purpose of Krishna consciousness. But you have to follow the process. You have to follow the process which is given to us by the teachers, by the acharyas. They're telling us how to do it. We're always saying, oh, well, I don't like that part. Oh, I can't do this part. <laughs> you know, we have so many, so many things, so many 
objections and we try to change everything. And then we wonder why we don't get the result. But you didn't follow. Krishna said, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. So Krishna is saying, you get the results of what you, what you deserve. If we don't surrender fully, we cannot expect to get the full result. So gradual, it's a gradual process. Gradually we become convinced that we need to surrender. We need to give up this independence. We need to take shelter of Krishna. Right? Everyone agree? Completely yes. agree. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Very difficult due to attachments and illusion and Maya. I am very strong. But like you said, we have to practice and it appears generate. to be very difficult. It appears to be difficult, but once you actually once you actually let go, you realize, you know, it wasn't so difficult. Yeah, because it's actually our that eternal position to Krishna, to be with Krishna. Right. And when we make a little attempt, Krishna helps us. <laughs> Krishna, there's a, there's a verse that says... Uh, the material existence appears like a big ocean. But when we surrender to Krishna, that ocean becomes like the water, which is in the footprint of a calf. It becomes like a little pool, tiny pond. You can easily cross over it. You don't need a boat. In the beginning, we're thinking, I need a boat. Oh, it's so big. I got to cross this big ocean. It's so far. I need a boat. But once you actually surrender to Krishna, it becomes a very tiny amount of water, very easy to cross over. Yes? Any other questions? So, Guru Maharaj, if they become fully Krishna conscious, they, they, will, they have to still chant the holy names? Or it's not there. If we become fully Krishna conscious, we will naturally chant the holy name without even thinking about it. We'll be chanting all the time in ecstasy. When we become fully Krishna conscious, we won't need to be counting how many rounds we chanted. We'll just chant. Incessantly. Lord Chaitanya himself had japa beads. He was carrying his beads with him. After he took sannyas, he went and he had his japa beads. He was carrying his japa beads. He was chanting. The Goswamis in Vrindavan, they also had their japa malas. They were chanting all the time. Yeah, we can't stop these activities. We have to keep chanting. But there's a difference in the mood that, you know, we're thinking, oh, I still have two rounds to chant. Oh, I still have, I, I didn't finish my rounds yet. The go, the go, you know, the, the Krishna conscious person won't be like that. They will be chanting all the time, naturally, spontaneously, because they've come to the higher at the higher platform. They're naturally Krishna conscious. You know, we cannot imagine it. You know, we're thinking in our conditioned state, you know, we try to understand the mood of these devotees. Because we're so conditioned, we're so attached, we're so much in the bodily concept of life, it's difficult for us. But if we become Krishna conscious, the more we become Krishna conscious, 
the more you get a natural taste. You know, like Pr Prabhupada, we would always see Prabhupada chanting, hardly, hardly sleeping, wake up, you know, if you woke up at two o'clock in the morning, you could go to Prabhupada's room, you'd be sitting there writing. So they didn't waste time eating and sleeping <laughs> and mating and defending. And Prabhupada also said, he said, I gave up mating and defending when I was a young man. Now in my old age, I've also given up eating and sleeping. And so when you don't do these things, you have so much time to chant. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Someone. Guru Maharaj, you said uh, that uh, the more we chant, the more we can develop attraction for Krishna, right? Yes. So, so is it like I, I can chant only a few rounds uh, in three hours? Like, should I increase the number of rounds or uh, because my chanting is a bit slow? Uh, it is the number of rounds or uh, it is okay if we can chant slowly, but... Uh, uh, how to well, do this, Guru Maharaj? There, there are no rules for the chanting. We see, Lord Chaitanya said, there's no rules in the chant. Some people may chant very quickly, and other people may chant very slowly. But there is some need for, a, you know, a, a, a minimum amount of chanting we're supposed to do. And so Srila Prabhupada had given us that, that we should chant 16 rounds. And that's required. We have to chant 16 rounds. So you have, to, you have to consider how you can chant a little bit. Maybe, maybe you're ch how long is it taking you to chant one round? Uh, Guru Maharaj, it, uh, maybe 10 minutes. Sometimes the overall 16 rounds takes me two and a half hours to three hours. Oh, that's good. That's good timing. Not so, it's not so slow. Ah, okay. That's pretty okay. average. Pretty average, two to three hours, yeah. Most ah, people okay. are in that position, yeah. Ah, okay, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. So keep chanting, and you always try to try to do more chanting. Keep your peace <laughs> with you. Yes, Guru Maharaj. I've never been able to do more chanting. Except on Ega Didi Desh, I do 25, but other days, um, yes, Guru Maharaj. Oh, very good. You do 25 rounds on Ega Desi, yeah, you should. Very nice. Yeah, yes, Guru Maharaj. So, yeah, keep chanting. I have a question, Gurudev. Yes? Gurudev, he says that uh, a, a fully Krishna conscious person, therefore, he has no longer any obligations to the Vedic injunctions. Can we explain that, Gurudev? Yes, Vedic injunctions, you know, things like taking three baths a day and worshipping the forefathers and, you know, these different kinds of things. The morning, morning prayers you're supposed to do, Vedic injunctions, okay. and offering to the forefathers taking the bath and uh, different times of the day. These, different, these are Vedic injunctions. And then also at the age of 50, you're supposed to go and retire, go to the forest. Oh. You know that, Vanaprastha, you know, <laughs> these kind of things. Okay. So Vedic injunctions, you, you're not obliged to do these things. Vedic injunctions, you're not supposed to cross the ocean, you're not supposed to, oh. So as per what they say here, a fully Krishna conscious person, which means, uh, does it apply to sannyasis or 
and even uh, like a very elevated elevated devotees yes. only to sannyasis yeah that's right yes only mostly then yeah. oh. fully krishna conscious person I mean, yes. somebody who's fully engaged in Krishna's service. Yes. Fully dedicated to the service of Krishna. So they're not required to do these kind of things. Like, you know, if somebody in the family dies, you should go to do some uh, shrad for them. You're not required to do that. Or maybe there's a marriage. You're supposed to come for the fact, for, for the marriage. You're not required to do that. You know, because you're you're already detached from all this. Yes, but when a person dies, though certain rituals, so we have to perform. No good there. Yeah, but if somebody is a sannyasi, they don't have to do it. Somebody oh. else can do it. But supposing in the family, you huh? uh, supposing in the family, if oh. that person is elevated. And the other people are not, uh, you know, they are not devotees, or they are half devotees. So then, then, uh, then we have we have to perform all that for for the other people. No, no, they can do it because they're not devoted, but they're, you know, they're partly devoted, so that they should follow the Vedic injunctions. It's good for them. Okay. They should do these things. But one who is a full, fully Krishna conscious person, they don't have to do it. They can, they may do it, but they don't have to do it. Means for that person. Yeah. For the elevated person, they don't have to do all that. Right. Okay. Thank you, Guru Dev. Just like Prabhupada would do things like, you know, young couples, he would get them married. The young yes. man and the young woman would get them married and Prabhupada himself would do the marriage. No, Prabhupada is a sannyasi. Sannyasi is not supposed to do a marriage, but Prabhupada would do it because for the benefit of the couple. Yes. That they needed to get married. There was nobody else to do the marriage. So Prabhupada would do it himself. Yes. But, of course, gradually Prabhupada let other people do that. He didn't keep doing that. As soon as other people were there, let them do it. He had yes. his disciples do the marriage. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll chant one round. Yes. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Sorry, Guru Maharaj. I just wanted...